Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you back in the conference room. And we have our next session, which uh, the centerpiece of it would be a keynote, uh, sorry, a session uh, talk by Dr. Gokan. Now, it would be sacrilegious of me to introduce a former deputy governor of the RPI to a room full of CFOs and you know finance professionals, but I'll commit that sacrilege anyways. Dr. Gokan is the director of research right now at Brookings India. He was the deputy governor of the RBI till January 2013, and he's had long years of looking at the monetary policy, the macroeconomic, you know, outlook from India and you know from a Indian and a global lens. So he was earlier chief economist at the SNP, and he's also been a nominee board member you know, on the board of uh, State Bank of India. He's an economics graduate from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and completed his postgraduate degree from Delhi School of Economics. And his doctorate was from Case Western Reserve University at Ohio. So here is Dr. Gokarn. I'll not take any spare minute from the audiences. Uh, so the way we'll run this session is that Dr. Gokan will set the context, you know, for the overall conversation on the economy uh, of what he sees uh, both in India and globally, and then we'll follow it up with, uh, you know, Mr. Deepak Kiwala, who is the Executive Vice President and Financial Controller at Kotak Mahindra Bank. So he'll talk about his perspective of the banking industry, I mean, taking off from what Dr. Gokan, you know, speaks about. This would be followed by uh, Mr. G. Subramaniam, who's with Hathaway and has over 30 years of experience in the finance function. So over to you, gentlemen. for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, having been in the private sector for some years, uh, an invitation from the CFO to come to his office was always a source of great intimidation for me. I usually came out of the room with my you know, revenue targets doubled and my expense budgets halved. So you can imagine I'm feeling a little nervous in a room full of 80 or 90 CFOs. But uh, let me try and provide some perspective on uh, what's been going on in financial markets, both globally and domestically in the last few months, because uh, obviously these are uh, forces and factors that will shape your thinking, your optimism or pessimism, and the way you treat your non-financial colleagues in your companies over the next few months. Uh, I think we have to do some sort of uh, counterfactual here, which is to look at a possible scenario. Uh, let's pretend that May did not happen. We, we have the scenario up to April 2013. In that scenario, things were looking reasonably uh, stable. Uh, we know, of course, that the rupee had depreciated a fair amount from going back to August 2011, but uh, at least in the first half of the first four months of this year, there were clear signs of stability. And uh, in terms of the larger macroeconomic uh, environment, things were starting to look like a recovery was in progress. Uh, most people who made beginning of year forecasts, everybody, including private forecasters. We're looking at 2013-14 uh, being somewhat better than 12-13. Uh, the government's own forecast was 6.4 if you took the midpoint, which is seen by most people as being over-optimistic. But in the private sector, between 5.5 and 6, there was a pretty significant uh, dense clustering of forecasts. 
Inflation was going down. It had been on the decline for uh, at least three or four months, and obviously that had triggered uh, the RBI's uh, rate cutting cycle, which uh, started in January. Well, actually started in April 2012, but then was resumed in January, and we had three successive cuts: January, March, and and uh, early May. So, had that scenario persisted, uh, I think the expectation for both the current year and perhaps the next year or two uh, would have been far more positive. There were, of course, many stress points. There was uh, a fiscal stress point. Uh, we knew that the current account was causing a lot of uh, problem, but uh, it had not precipitated into uh, a serious uh, sort of uh, shock. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said, had things continued without May happening, if you just projected from April onwards, uh, we would have probably been uh, in the kind of scenario that we're seeing, particularly the U.S. economy being now, which is a slow, steady, not a very dramatic recovery, but uh, a recovery taking place, monetary policy having the room to, uh, to provide some stimulus, uh, fiscal correction going on, particularly being signaled by the steady uh, correction in diesel prices, uh, things looked stable. Not great, not uh, uh, terribly buoyant, but stable. So what happened in May then? Obviously the trigger for this currency shock was an announcement by the Fed that uh, the economic conditions in the US had improved to the point where it could now start thinking of rolling back its unconventional monetary policy or quantitative easing QE as it's been referred to. Uh, now, the significance, the, the, the magnitude of the impact of this uh, announcement on global markets uh, was quite, I think, unanticipated and, and very, very dramatic. Uh, currencies everywhere. Uh, came crashing down, markets everywhere came crashing down. And uh, in hindsight, you have to ask the question, you know, who ever thought or believed that QE was a permanent situation? That the Fed had put money into the system, such large quantities of money into the system, that it would never take back, that it would let uh, this, this amount remain circulating the system for, for eternity. And nobody thought that. Everybody believed that somewhere a recovery would happen, and as it happened, the rollback would start. It was a matter of quick timing and magnitude and pace, but not of the realization, not the, not nobody questioned the fact that it would happen. And yet, the markets uh, reacted so sharply. So this, I think, raises some very important questions, and therefore, consequently, uh, provide some indications of how global markets have behaved during the crisis and whether uh, post QE some new order or new, new source of stability emerges. So I'll, I'll address that question uh, a little later. But looking at it from India's perspective, what was the source of this enormous impact on the currency? We saw it move from somewhere in the mid 50s to uh, the bottom of 68. It's now around 63, between 63, 64 range. And uh, that, I think, is a question that has a much more straightforward answer. Uh, I'd like to just use a very simple equation as a framework to understand what happened and how it happened. Uh, and that equation is uh, that impact uh, is equal to shock into vulnerability. Simple product that uh, the impact of any shock is magnified by the degree of vulnerability that it faces. And when you look uh, at the global impact or across countries impact of the Fed's announcement and subsequent reinforcement of the announcement, uh, there's a very clear correlation. That correlation is uh, with the current account deficit. Countries that had large current account deficits saw maximum uh, depreciation in the currencies, maximum volatility in the currencies, and countries that had 
either low deficits or surpluses, which many emerging economies have, uh, saw relatively uh, small impacts on their currencies. So this obviously brings into focus uh, the nature of the vulnerability. The shock was common, everybody faced it. That was the, the Fed announcement. Uh, the impact was differentiated, which means that the vulnerability was differentiated. So why is the Indian economy, along with some of the others, but I don't want to get too far out of uh, my, my focus by bringing in other countries, let me focus on India. Uh, what, what happened here? Uh, now, we know that the current account for, go back to 1991 uh, and end in 2010-11, uh, has never exceeded 3% of GDP. There are years in this period when it has been in surplus. There were three years in the mid-2000s when it was in surplus. But the highest it got was something like 2.8 or 2.9, and 3%, I think, was reached in 1991. So that's really the beginning of this period. But in 2010-11, it went to 4.2% of GDP in 2000, sorry, not 10-11, in 11-12, 4.2, and then 12-13, uh, 4.8. And that jump was uh, the result of four factors. Uh, Two have been somewhat more persistent, two uh, were relatively recent. Uh, the persistent ones are well known. There was oil, oil pr combination of oil prices and growth in consumption. There was gold, which saw imports going up from about 1.3, 1.4% of GDP five years ago to over 3% of GDP now. The two proximate ones, the two that uh, precipitated in the last two years were iron ore and coal. So we basically stopped exporting iron ore. We saw iron ore exports drop from about six billion, slightly over six billion dollars in the two years preceding to about one and a half billion in the last full year. And we saw coal imports, non-coking coal imports go up from virtually nothing five years ago to over eight billion dollars in 12-13. So if you add up these shocks, you can see a fairly a uh, simple story uh, which leads to the kind of vulnerability that we have seen in the, uh, in the current account. Now, if you're looking at prospects and how we are going to stabilize the situation, we can talk of lots of things. We can talk of uh, fiscal deficits, we can talk of uh, productivity or competitiveness or whatever it is. And all of these are important, all of them are relevant. But I think it's very important to recognize that in order to achieve uh, any kind of stability on the external front, uh, and this includes uh, currency risk, that uh, we have to see these four stress points being addressed in some fashion. Uh, can they be addressed overnight? Can you just start to, you know, can you cut down coal uh, or oil consumption overnight? You can't. You can't do it, expect any of these factors to be reversed uh, on a dime, as they say, within, within a year or so. But I think we need to see uh, actions that are consistent, that are credible, uh, strategies that are uh, addressing them in some fashion. Uh, let me give you a simple example of the, or illustration of how the market differentiates between temporary and permanent shocks to the balance of payments. Uh, we had started importing coal maybe three or four years ago, as I said. And this was very, uh, in a sense, positive because we had uh, massive amounts of power generating capacity coming up. And in the last four or five years, if you just look at the addition of generation capacity, uh, it's been amongst the most successful sort of uh, episodes in terms of, of new capacity being created. Some of it was gas-fired, most of it was coal. Uh, there was some expectation that coal, we all know the, the, the background to the coal story, but there was some expectation that uh, domestic coal would come online. And in the meantime, well, let's import it. You know, it's not going to be very long-lived. It's not going to be something that's going to be forever. So uh, no problem. 
As soon as the perception that coal imports were now going to be permanent uh, settled or entrenched itself, which essentially is the case now, uh, that I believe had a very strong impact on currency expect on the expectations of the exchange because the difference between a temporary balance of payments disruption and a permanent one is has a very very strong bearing on how markets in general perceive currencies. Uh, it results in uh, an immediate re-rating, and I think that's partly why we saw such sharp movements, not just uh, uh, large movements, but very quick movements in the currency over this uh, uh, these last few months. Uh, we've had three episodes of currency instability over the last two years. The first one was in August 2011 and ran more or less up to about December. The second one was uh, beginning or began in March of 2012 and ran till about September. In both these periods, uh, the movement of the currency was quite sharp. Uh, it obviously created a lot of uh, anguish as the more recent uh, trend has. And of course, many things were done uh, by the Reserve Bank and by the government to try and bring some control over this. But uh, real, realistically speaking, what made the difference then uh, is not what we did, but uh, the actions taken in the first instance in December 2011 by the ECB uh, in the form of what is called the long-term refinance operations. And uh, in the second instance, in September 2012, uh, the, the QE3 that uh, the Fed launched. Now, if you take these two episodes as a backdrop to the current one, there is an obvious and very fundamental difference. Those two were ended by liquidity enhancement measures by Western central banks. This one was triggered by a denouncement that these liquidity measures will be rolled back. And therefore, there is very little prospect that the same solution will uh, come to the rescue. So we're looking at currency is stabil stabilizing, uh, the answer then was, well, you know, it can happen because of global factors and perhaps there are some global factors that can, can help it stabilize even now, but they're not the same as we saw in the previous two episodes. Uh, or they have to come from domestic changes, they have to come from what the policy establishment does to address these uh, very, very pressing Sort of uh, factors, these huge source of pressure on the current account. So, if you're looking at stabilization, the prospects for stabilization, uh, global conditions will help. The fact that Syria has become a somewhat less significant risk over the last few days compared to a couple of weeks ago, uh, which has immediately translated into lower oil prices. The fact that the US uh, initial, the, the indicators leading up to next week's uh, FOMC meeting are generally speaking below expectations, which opens up the possibility that the Fed will not change its position uh, in terms of having stated an intent to roll back uh, and move to more specific commitments in terms of timing or magnitude. So if, uh, if it is left hanging, which I think now becomes more of a prospect, uh, this will help to stabilize global markets. So we may see more of what's been happening over the last few days in terms of, uh, of inflows and general evaluations, which also leads to some stability on the rupee and also, of course, other emerging market currencies as well. But what this means is that, uh, or, or so let's say what this hides actually, is that the domestic vulnerability remains very much in play. So if there is another global shock, an external shock of any kind, and we haven't taken credible steps domestically to address the vulnerability, uh, we could see a repeat of the story. I think that's the basic concern now. And when you look back over the last two episodes, uh, perhaps in hindsight one could argue that the relatively short-lived nature of those episodes actually contributed to a sense of complacency where the underlying factors were simply not given the attention that they 
they deserve. And uh, had we not had the LTRO or the uh, QE3 in 2011, 2012, uh, what we're seeing happen today could well have uh, repeated it, uh, could, could well have happened in either of those episodes as well. So I think the, the, the bottom line in terms of uh, currency expectations is right now, uh, unless we start to uh, put a lot of uh, weight into a strategy to contain the current account, uh, we will remain vulnerable to external shocks. Uh, what are the external shocks that might trigger this? Uh, clearly, we've seen with the Syrian episode that uh, 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 heightened tensions, poss possibility of conflict in the Middle East is an immediate shock. We, we saw that demonstrated very, very vividly in the last week of August. Uh, from our own perspective, I think uh, a rating downgrade is uh, a likely shock. I don't uh, make any predictions on the likelihood or, uh, or the higher or lower likelihood of this. But uh, with the kind of fiscal pressures that the under recoveries are now uh, are now creating, uh, recreating actually, uh, we should basically be looking at the scenario we had in late 2012 before the diesel price adjustment started uh, in in earnest. That uh, there was a risk then; it was being talked about quite uh, widely. Uh, the scenario has returned and uh, the risk therefore I think has to be taken very seriously. If that were to happen, that would be another shock on the, uh, on the, uh, from the external sector or the external front and obviously would have major, major impact on the currency. Now let me just focus a little bit on the domestic, so exchange at risk if I were to put it on a scale of 1 to 10 or put it on a low, medium, high scale, I think uh, it is quite high uh, even though we've seen this recent stabilization. I hope it, that those risks don't materialize, but we should not be uh, making plans without adequate uh, uh, recognition of those risks. On the domestic front, as I said, if we flat reverse, you know, rewind back to May or April, uh, the interest rate cycle was looking, again, if not very dramatically uh, pro-growth, was certainly starting to move in that direction and was, I think, starting to trigger some sense of uh, positivity on, even if not large uh, greenfield kind of projects, at least on inventory accumulation or replenishment and, and so brownfield, uh, deep bottleneck types of investments. That was where the growth forecasts were coming from. Uh, that has changed now for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, uh, the depreciation has reintroduced inflationary pressures and uh, to the extent that monetary policy will remain focused on inflation, uh, it will have to take account of the past through impacts of depreciation. Uh, the other is uh, what appear to be a regime change in the monetary policy process itself. Uh, when in July the objective implicitly shifted from managing growth, the growth inflation trade-off, to now managing the growth exchange rate trade-off. And the decisions to restrict domestic liquidity were essentially uh, a judgment or based on judgment that the consequences of excessive exchange rate volatility or exchange rate depreciation, rupee depreciation, were going to be more significant in terms of maintaining macro stability uh, than the impact that higher rates would have uh, on growth. Now, whether this judgment was the correct one or not is, I think, for uh, other people to, to, to decide. Uh, but it did signal uh, a change in the stance. And uh, unless we see a clear reversion to uh, a, the, the previous stance of the growth inflation trade-off, uh, we should expect interest rates to remain uh, under pressure. Uh, this is coming basically from the liquidity front, which you, know, you all deal with on a daily basis, so you know very well how it's played out. Uh, and also perhaps now from uh, a somewhat changed fiscal environment. 
which is that uh, with growth being uh, slower than expected, uh, government borrowing requirements, although this year uh, there is a very firm sort of commitment that they will be, that the levels will be maintained, uh, the tightness in the fiscal situation at some point is going to have to be addressed and government borrowing may put further pressure on uh, interest rates. So again, if I'm to look at interest rate uh, projections or, or make them without, uh, you know, so admittedly without any firm formal modeling here, uh, just uh, judgments based on these various drivers, uh, to me it looks like interest rates are likely to remain firm, perhaps even face upward pressure. This is essentially what we've seen over the last uh, two or three months, and I don't think that is going to abate in the absence of a very explicit change in stance uh, by the Reserve Bank, which may happen either in September or uh, in, uh, <coughs> in uh, the, at the end of October with the, with the second quarterly uh, policy review. Uh, that's broadly what I wanted to say in terms of uh, setting a macro context. I think uh, I want to emphasize a point. Uh, somebody asked me a question today. My fellow columnist, uh, Shankar Acharya, who was uh, chief economic advisor from the late 90s to, uh, I guess, 2003, uh, mid 90s to 2003, recently wrote a column in which he argued that. Uh, this is not 1991. Now, many people have been saying this or making this comparison from a positive perspective, which is things are not as bad today as they were in 1991. And there are some legitimate grounds for that assessment. But his point was that the opportunity we had for reform in 1991, uh, the low hanging fruit on trade reform, on de-licensing, on financial sector reform, on exchange rate uh, reform. All of those were sort of first generation reforms which were initiated in 1991 and basically gave us a growth dividend in some combination uh, for the decade after that. Uh, those are no longer available. We can't do the same kinds of things in 2030. So if you're looking at the kind of reform measures that we need to take us back to a high growth trajectory, whatever it may be, uh, and I think you know, nobody believes that we are stuck or we should be stuck at 4.4 or 4.5 uh, forever, uh, but the nature of the reform required, the nature of the change required is far more fundamental, is far deeper, uh, is far more, going to be far more painful and uh, consequently, the expectation that reform will sort of somehow do the same magic that it did in the early to mid 90s, I think has to be tempered. We have to be quite realistic about what needs to be done, uh, how difficult it is to do it, and how long it's going to take for these measures to start to have an impact. But at the same time, if this effort is not made, uh, the consequences uh, will be even worse. Uh, go back to the impact equals to shock into vulnerability and basically what I'm saying is that the absence of these measures is contributing to vulnerability in a far wider sense than just the current account deficit, which is what I've focused on to explain the current situation. Uh, so let me stop with that and uh, happy to take questions when the opportunity arises. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gokarn, for setting the context. Uh, in my rush to offer the stage to you, I did not introduce Devang properly. I 